This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. Thomas Crowther, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you very much for having me on. Well, Thomas, I realize you have some planet-scale solutions to help stave off the worst of climate change. But first, let me ask about carbon warming and the Arctic. Is the Earth losing more carbon from the soil into the atmosphere? It's a very good and important question. Essentially, there's an ongoing debate among scientists about whether the Earth's surface is going to continue to absorb some of the human emissions that we've been producing over the last 100 years. And a growing body of evidence is suggesting that that process is stopping in plants. And in fact, the soils might in fact be becoming a source of carbon. As we warm the, warm the planet, the activity of microorganisms in the soil starts to speed up. And this could actually increase losses of carbon into the atmosphere, which could accelerate the rate of climate change. Well, you've brought up another key question, which is, does global warming impact the rate or amount of carbon loss from the soil? This is ultimately one of the biggest, the biggest questions of ecosystem ecologists. I think, uh, at least in our lab, we're taking a very sort of global approach, a holistic global approach to consider the, the soils and the plants. And it suggests that when you take all of these ecosystems in combination, it does suggest that, yeah, we're, we're starting to get accelerated losses of carbon into the atmosphere. At the 2019 annual meeting of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, it was in Washington this February, you presented a chart that shows where carbon is buried under the soil. And I found it very surprising to see what part of the Earth has the biggest depository of carbon buried down there. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, it's fascinating. Essentially, we've always focused on the tropics for much of our climate change research because these are the areas where there's huge trees and huge carbon storage in the forest. But what we actually find when we look below the surface is actually that the vast, vast majority of the world's carbon is actually stored in the high latitude parts of the world, like the Arctic and subarctic regions. And these store a huge amount of carbon for a very simple reason. It's cold up there, and those cold conditions slow down the activity of the microorganisms in the soil. And when their activity is slowed down, they don't respire as much. And that slowed down respiration means that when carbon goes in, it stays in there for a long, long time, thousands of years, and it builds up to a huge extent. And that carbon storage in those soils is one of the biggest and most important stocks of carbon on our planet. But it's still surprising because so little vegetation grows up there at this time uh, compared to something like the Amazon, which is just a carbon storehouse. How could it all be up in the Arctic like that? It's a very good question. It's all about the balance between these two very simple processes. Photosynthesis is the uptake of carbon by plants, and respiration is the release of carbon back into the atmosphere. And what we find is actually that respiration is a lot more temperature sensitive than photosynthesis. And what that means is when it's warm, like in the tropics, photosynthesis is huge and plants are taking up loads and loads of carbon. But respiration is even higher. So when that when the leaves fall and when that plant carbon goes into the soil, the activity of those microorganisms in the soil is so high that they just spew the carbon back into the atmosphere in most parts of the tropics. That I, I would put a caveat that that doesn't happen in wetlands, which are very anaerobic, and so that you can build up a lot of soil carbon there. But in most of the tropics, you see this huge loss of carbon into the, into the atmosphere from the soils. In contrast, when we go down into the cold areas, Photosynthesis is very low. As you said, plants are tiny. They're taking up a small amount of carbon, but respiration is even lower. So even though a very small drip of carbon is coming into those ecosystems, it's not leaving because the microorganisms in the soil are so cold and they're so slow that that carbon just stays there for thousands of years and builds up gradually over time. Is there enough carbon held now in the Arctic and subarctic to actually affect our future climate if it starts to become released at a greater rate? I would stress with all urgency that yes, the answer is overwhelmingly yes. The amount of carbon stored in those high latitudes is huge, many times more than all of the plant vegetation in total. And if we're going to start warming our planet to an extent that those microorganisms start respiring at a faster and faster rate, 
then those carbon, those huge carbon stocks become very, very vulnerable. So managing those ecosystems and trying to keep temperatures cool, keep plants on those soils, managing them effectively, reducing tillage and damage can be maybe one of our most effective strategies to minimize the impacts of climate change. In an interview with David Gadsden, you said there are probably more animals in the Arctic than in the tropics. Now, that's just preposterous. How could that be? (laughs) Yeah, it sounds crazy, but our initial suggestions are pointing in that direction. I should stress that the exact information on this topic will be has just been accepted for, for publication, in a, and I'll be able to give you the exact details on, the, uh, on that information when it, when it comes out in, in the journal. But we can point towards suggesting that, yes, in fact, most of the world's animals exist below the soil in the form of these tiny little nematode worms. Almost four out of every, every five animals on the planet is a nematode worm. And these are some of the microorganisms that exist in those huge soil carbon stocks in the high latitude regions. And remember, these go all the way from the Arctic, you know, down to like the UK, down to halfway through North America. These are, this is the whole Arctic and subarctic area. And these are teeming with organisms. And in fact, when we go further down into the tropics, the soil carbon storage is so small there, it's not enough to support a huge amount of those organisms. So it may in fact be the case that yes, those high latitude areas are where most of the world's life is. And some of this knowledge comes from the first global map of life under the soil developed by your lab? That's it, yeah. So our our lab's trying to sort of do science with a slightly different approach. Rather than focusing purely on on satellites, which have been transformative in our understanding of, you know, the global scale ecosystems, what we do now is we collect thousands and thousands and thousands of data points, which can allow us to see below the canopy surface. So we can see information about the trees and also about the soil organisms. And when we use artificial intelligence and machine learning, we can really get a good picture of the entire global ecosystem below that surface. Thomas Crowther, tell us about the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. What is that? Okay, so this is an initiative that was set up several years ago by a lady called Diana Wall, who's a fantastic soil ecologist in the U.S. And she wanted ultimately to connect as many soil ecologists around the world as possible for one simple reason. We've got an amazing idea about the global distribution of plants, but almost no understanding about the global understanding of uh, these below-ground organisms that are so critical for understanding our biosphere and biogeochemistry and the climate and soil fertility. And by connecting those people, she was hoping that we might ultimately be able to combine forces and bring all of our ideas together. Now, what we've done in our lab is rather than just combining the people, we've used that network of people to combine as much data as we can. And so now we're we're, we're launching our Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative data set, which essentially has a lot of the information that's been collected by those thousands of people around the world to generate that global perspective of the below-ground world that's going to change our understanding of biogeochemistry. And we know the Arctic is warming faster than pretty well anywhere on the planet. Now, I'm trying to picture what happens in that Arctic and subarctic soil. Does that wake up a lot more life? Does it start that little factory that that releases carbon and methane? That's exactly the fear, yes. As you know, those huge carbon stores only happen there because it's cold. When we alleviate that cold, when we warm the temperatures those organisms start to speed up their activity, and that speeding up means respiratory losses of carbon into the atmosphere. And in fact, last year we showed that we can actually quantify these losses at a global scale, and we approximate that that's at the moment in the order of about 1.5 gigatons of carbon per year. So by 2050, we're looking at an extra 12 to 17% acceleration of climate change. And in fact, it's equivalent to having another industrialized country the size of the United States on the planet, really. And that's by 2050? Exactly. Wow. No, I mean, this is an annual loss. The the 1.5 gigatons is every other year. So if we heat up, say, three or four degrees above pre-industrial by the end of the century, which more scientists are starting to suggest here on Radio EcoShock, What does that do to the kind of carbon loss calculations and and the extra warming coming out of that new carbon into the atmosphere? From our understanding that we have at the moment, it suggests that that's only going to speed up those losses to a great extent. And given the huge, huge amounts of carbon in those high-latitude soils, 
I don't think it's going to be slowing down anytime soon, unfortunately, unless humans intervene, I should say. Yes. Okay. Well, that sounds like a dangerous positive feedback loop, though, because, I mean, as these organisms start releasing more carbon, the carbon becomes uh, greenhouse gases, which warms up the ground down below more, and, and then more activity. It's, that could be a dangerous chain. Yeah, that's exactly the concern. Yes, once we start off biological feedbacks like this, they then accentuate themselves. It's like a, a rolling cycle, you know, the Soil carbon loss increases, causing more warming, which causes the soil carbon loss to increase more, which causes more warming. And, yeah, the concern is that these things might accelerate to a great extent. And because it's a natural system, we can't just pass a law or make regulations to make it stop. (laughs) Quite exactly, yeah. So what we really need is to be proactive and get moving now to be able to minimize those increases in temperature as early as we can so that we can prevent setting off these huge global-scale feedbacks. This is Radio EcoShock. Laid up your iPod or computer with tons of free green audio from our website at www.ecoshock.org. That's E-C-O, shock like an electric shock, dot org. You are listening to Dr. Thomas Crow, the Assistant Professor of Global Ecosystem Ecology at ETH Zurich. This is Radio EcoShock, and I'm Alex Smith. Our second adventure, Thomas, goes into your projects, and it starts by asking how many trees there are on Earth. It sounds like maybe a simple question or maybe an impossible question. In fact, it seemed impossible before you tackled it. What did you find, and how did you do it? It is a fascinating question, because I I started this a a few years ago when I was connected by a friend who worked for an organization called Plant for the Planet. And they were running the UN Billion Tree Campaign. They were planning to plant a billion trees to, to offset climate change, capture loads of carbon from the trees. But they didn't know how many trees they were to start with. And in fact, there was a previous estimate of about 400 billion trees on the planet. So that's the information they used to make those, those targets. But after a little bit of back of the envelope calculations, we realized that that number was actually way off. And in fact, no one had done a really robust census of the world's trees. And by doing so, by collecting, again, data from thousands and thousands, in fact, millions of locations around the world, we could get a really good picture on how the numbers of trees vary across the globe. And in fact, that showed us that the Earth stores just over 3 trillion trees. Wow, you're talking about almost like stars in the sky, 3 trillion, that's quite interesting. Are we losing or gaining trees on this planet? It's interesting you should make the analogy with stars in the sky because... Literally, there are more trees on our planet than there are stars in our galaxy, which is quite an incredible feat. But the concern is ultimately that we are good evidence to suggest that we are, in fact, losing trees. Now, plenty of research suggests that, in fact, in many parts of the world, we're seeing greening. So satellites are picking up more and more and more greening of certain ecosystems. And that's often in the high latitude parts of the world where forests didn't previously exist. As we warm the planet, trees sort of encroach into those ecosystems. But what we're finding is that the small amount of extra trees, tiny extra trees that we're getting in those high latitude areas is unfortunately not enough to offset the huge amount of losses that we see in the low latitude, you know, tropical areas as a result of deforestation and land use change. Well, just now we talked about investigating life in the soil. How does that relate to the life of forests? These things are so intrinsically linked. Absolutely, a healthy soil is critical if we're going to be able to build a healthy forest. And both of them are undoubtedly necessary for, for each other. It's funny, as a, as a scientist who works both on soil and vegetation, I often get questions about one topic or the other. And in fact, it's an incredibly connected holistic system. And having that holistic approach is definitely the best strategy for management in both directions. So soil people ask me, how do we manage our soils? And I say, generally, you know, there's different strategies around the world, but one of the best strategies is you can always say increasing plant cover is usually a good thing and minimizing disturbance is a good thing. The same questions are asked to me of forest people, and I say improve the soils, support the soils, then the trees can be supported. So it's, they really, healthy soils require healthy vegetation and vice versa. And you claim to have identified long disappeared forests how could you do that? I should state that that's not parts of the world 
that weren't previously known to man. What we've done is instead begin to understand the full scale of the world's forests. So while satellites could say, okay, this is an area of trees, they vastly underestimated how many trees existed in those areas and how many new trees could be supported in different parts of the world. So it's really not so much identifying new forests, as identifying the scale of our forests. And that transforms our understanding of how we manage them in the fight against climate change. And you claim we could grow another 1.2 trillion new trees. Where could these be planted, and do we have to give up croplands or city space to do it? No, that is a very good point. We evaluated where on the planet trees could exist, using the same sort of approach that we did to evaluate where they do exist. And you're right, we found that, in fact, outside of the world's forests and outside of the world's urban areas and outside of the world's world's agricultural areas where they are today, there's room for an additional 1.2 trillion new trees. And as a result of that kind of information, the UN's billion tree campaign has now been scaled up to the trillion tree campaign. And the exciting thing is I was concerned about giving them this information because I thought it might undermine their efforts. But instead, with the new updated scientific information, they took this in such a positive light. And, in fact, and instead of moping around, they've incredibly they've stepped up their efforts and they know their new targets. And already in the last couple of years, they've restored 17 billion new trees, proving that global scale restoration is undoubtedly possible. Tell us about the Plant for the Planet initiative. This is uh, uh, a group of essentially children advocates. It's a youth-led organization with 70,000 members all across the world going around and and, and talking to people and promoting global forest restoration and its potential to offset climate change. And the beauty of it is they don't just do that with the most effective, up-to-date scientific information, but it's children. And and they're they're inspiring people across the globe to really get involved in, in tree planting. And one of their mottos that I really like is the simple statement of stop talking and start planting. And I find myself eternally embroiled in debates about whether tree restoration is the most important or or cutting carbon emissions are the most important. And these debates are not useful. Essentially, we are all in agreement that we must minimize atmospheric carbon. Global forest restoration is undoubtedly one of the best strategies we have for doing that. So they just go out there and act. And if people want to get involved in that mission, they are incredibly keen for others to to get on board and, and they're growing at a great rate. Could you give us one example of a place where we could install a new forest? Literally everywhere across the globe, there are forests that could be restored. Now, where our science is trying to focus on is trying to understand which parts of the world are the most important for them to be able to allocate those resources. So in some parts of the world, you know, like the high-latitude boreal forests, planting a forest can actually warm the planet slightly. Of course, it's still better for biodiversity and all the services they provide, But there can be a warming effect because whereas those ecosystems were previously covered in snow, now trees would actually absorb a lot of the sunlight and have a slight warming impact. Whereas often in the low latitudes, in the tropical forests, as you mentioned, those huge carbon storage, carbon stocks in the vegetation have the potential to offset a huge amount of anthropogenic emissions. So we can start to target which are the best locations for them to be able to prioritize their restoration. Well, suppose we mount a gigantic worldwide program to plant a trillion new trees with the UN, with the kids, with local citizen groups, with some of my listeners, and we do it in part to save the climate. Could it help save the climate? Our research is providing more and more and more evidence that not only is such a global initiative possible, but it undoubtedly could have a massive impact on the climate. Unfortunately, I'm not able to give you the exact numbers because the paper that we've recently completed is currently in review in a, in a high-impact journal. But when that paper is finally completed, we'll be able to give the exact numbers on how much carbon could potentially be stored in those forests. And what I can confirm is that that value places global forest restoration way above all of the other existing climate change solutions listed. So this simple act of just connecting with the land and planting a few trees, if we all engaged in it, it undoubtedly has the potential to offset a massive chunk of anthropogenic emissions. Well, lately news came out that the boreal forest stretching across the northern lands has become a net source of carbon instead of the carbon sink we assumed. And I think part of that may have to do with wildfires. I'm not sure. Does that match your findings? 
It does, in fact. And, and that's partly because of wildfires and increased incidents of wildfires, but also because although we are seeing increased growth of trees, as I mentioned earlier, as the climate warms, the soil below those trees is getting warmer and the microorganisms are starting to respire more rapidly. And so even though trees are taking up more carbon, the soils are actually emitting even more than the trees are taking up. And again, that's that positive climate change feedback that could really accelerate climate change. It's a big concern. Environmentalists have long claimed that replanting monocultures like a single commercial tree species after logging is the wrong way to go. Thomas Crowther, do you have the science now to prove that's true? We undoubtedly do. Once again, with this global scale approach, we can see past the idiosyncrasy of individual site analyses. So there have been lots of studies saying, you know, a more diverse forest is better or a monoculture is better in different parts of the world. But by taking data from every single, all these millions of locations around the world, we can get a global unifying perspective. And what we find is consistently at a global scale, more species is always better than fewer species. We, in fact, did a back-of-the-envelope scaling in one of our recent papers to show that the the global forests are worth just over $600 billion to the the timber market and the pulp and paper industry and forestry. If we were to instead convert the world's forests to a monoculture of the most productive forests, those forests, even with the same number of trees in those forests, if it was just a monoculture, would lose almost $300 billion just to the timber market. It's a massive difference. And so undoubtedly, diversity of species is always better. So monoculture is just a, it's a bad business decision. Undoubtedly. It's a bad business decision. And for the ecology of these ecosystems, it's a devastating one because we know that diversity provides such services to support all other parts of life, which also then support human life. They capture less carbon, so the monocultures aren't as good at offsetting climate change. So in most, in almost all circumstances, diversity is much better than a monoculture. And we talked about the soil initiative. What is the Global Forest Biodiversity Initiative? So this is a huge network of data collection that we've started in our lab, very similar to the Soil Biodiversity Initiative data set, where instead of relying on satellites alone, we can now connect all the thousands of foresters around the world who are generating incredibly good and detailed information on the ground. They've been in those forests, they've measured those trees, they've evaluated the health of those ecosystems. And by sending in all of that data, we can combine all that information at a global scale. Then using machine learning and artificial intelligence, again, we can get that really good predictive understanding of the structure of forests that's built from bottom-up data rather than satellites. When I watch a couple of your YouTube video presentations, I'm stunned by the brand new maps of where things grow on our planet or life we've never seen hidden underground. And I expect experts to use GIS or geographic information systems to communicate complex results so we can all understand them. But it seems to me you've gone another step. You use those maps as tools of discovery to find new things. Is that true? That's exactly true. By combining these huge data sets of information, not only do we reveal where ecosystems can store more carbon or less carbon or more biodiversity, but we also just learn fundamental new things about the planet that we couldn't have known from taking a local scale approach, like how many trees exist on the planet or the fact that there's more carbon in the high latitudes than the low latitudes. And every time we combine this global scale information, we get completely new insights into our biosphere. And it's only with that kind of understanding that we can be really effective in our fight against climate change. Do you see a time coming when the public will be able to use your interactive maps to zoom into our own home regions to see what grows or what could grow where we live? Definitely. That time is very soon. With geographic information systems, and in fact, Google Earth Engine is an incredibly useful tool that that can be used to take those maps and place them onto systems that can be easily used by people at home. And in fact, we're we're starting to do that now. So all of our maps, as soon as they're published, they're going to be uploaded and available. So you can click onto your Google Maps and you can actually zoom around the world and go, how many trees are there here? How many trees could there be here in the absence of humans? And how much carbon could they support? 
And the nice thing is, you know, I've been doing it myself in the last couple of days. We, the first thing you do is you zoom in on your home and you go, oh, how many trees should there be here? Whoa, there should be loads. Okay, cool. This place can support a lot of forest. And just that spatial perspective, I hope it's going to inspire people to really get engaged and feel connected to the planet. Thomas Crowther, I last talked with you in December 2016 after you published your paper quantifying global soil carbon losses in response to warming, and that was in the journal Nature. Do you have any new surprises that have developed from your research since then? I have to say that every time we get one of these global perspectives, it's a bit of a new surprise. At the moment, we have four papers that are currently under review that are really going to transform our understanding of the distribution of biodiversity and carbon storage in the biosphere. But until they come out, I can't quite give you the exact numbers. So hopefully in the very near future, I'll be able to provide all of that information to you, and hopefully people can use it to make effective climate change decisions. Well, I'll be watching my science alert service, and then I can pass it on to listeners when your papers come out. And as a final question, Thomas, you've developed some answers about the world we didn't have before, and I'd love to ask you what it is that sparks this blast of science in your head, but I also suspect maybe that's one of the few things you don't know for sure. Your thoughts? I think you may well be right. It's, I've always been inspired by diversity. Anyone who says there's no magic in the world, I just challenge them to look outside the window and look at the immense biodiversity that scientists have no meaningful explanation for. We don't know how life arose, let alone is maintained. And this has always just inspired me. But I think the recent developments in our research are partially due to that inspiration by biodiversity, but also a lot of luck. We've come here, I'm starting to do this at a time when data is available. We can finally start to get this global scale perspective. And so every new piece of information seems to unlock new pieces of information. And I think it's just an incredibly exciting time to be involved in this. I'll let you go now. Thomas, thank you for your work and for sharing it with us on Radio EcoShock. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great to chat to you. From ETH Zurich in Switzerland, we spoke with Dr. Thomas Crowther. Find links to the science we discussed, a couple of videos with his amazing computer-driven maps, and the links to the Crowther Lab in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org.